Welcome to Soul Church Online. We're so glad you tuned in today from all over the world to be part of our service. Yeah, and we pray that the worship and the message encourages you and inspires you. So be blessed, sit back and enjoy the service. We're going to finish up the final part of this series, Recognizing the Times. Now, we've been out on the streets for the final time. Well, Will has. Hasn't he done a great job? Let's give Will a hand. This is... And we've been chatting to some of the locals, it's really asking them what they think is happening in our world. What, what would, would they be interested in ever coming to church or yeah, exploring faith? So let's see what they say this week. I don't think it's the healthiest compared to maybe some years ago. Yeah. Because just like the social media and everything. Yeah. Uh, affecting a lot of people's mental mental health. I think times are just getting harder for everyone. Like in terms of like money wise, education wise, I don't think the the right things are being taught. Things are just falling apart at the centre. People don't know. Uh, they don't know that there's any kind of truth that's absolute. Everybody says, oh, well, it's according to you. Everybody's yeah. got their own sort of spin on things. That's so yeah. not really healthy. It's quite rough, really. Yeah. For lots of places around the world. My times are pretty good, but that's quite narrow-minded. There's a lot going on in the world uh, that could and should change. Yeah, have you guys ever been to a church? I have. I have yeah. when I was little. Yeah. yeah. Was that the last time you went? Yeah. What about you? When was the last time you went? It's been a while, to be honest. I should I should touch up on it. You have. When was the last time you went? I used to work in them for quite a bit. I, I did stained glass windows, so we were oh, nice. yeah, fixing, taking the windows out, fixing them. If someone was to invite you to a service on a Sunday, would you go? I wouldn't. I wouldn't be closed-minded to it. I'd definitely be open-minded. If someone was to invite you guys to a church, would you go? Would you go with them? Potentially. If I'm invited, then Fine. yeah, yeah. Have you ever been invited to church? No, I haven't. No. If you were invited to church, would you go? I'm, I don't follow any religion of sorts, but yeah, I'd be open to the uh, open to the finish. What time do you finish? About four on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Will we have a five pm yeah. service? Okay, brilliant. Will you be there? Yeah, definitely. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Good to meet you, my man. For the final time, Jesus Christ. In fact, let's say it together. Jesus Christ is coming back. The world as we know it will end. Those who know Christ will spend eternity with him. Those who don't will Christ spend eternity in hell. Wow. This series is really not to scare us, but again, help us to recognize the things that have been unfolding. And in the Gospels, Jesus addresses six big questions. First question is, why does Jesus need to return, which we unpacked in week one? We realize it's to save us from ourselves because without Jesus coming back, as we can see, our world will self-destruct. When will this happen? Well, nobody knows the exact day or time. What are the signs? Deception, division, disasters, defamation, desertion, disinformation, and declaration. How should we live? Steve talked brilliantly about stewarding and carrying the presence of God in the oil. Two weeks ago, we, we talked about where will we go? What happens when we leave this earth? Two gates, two paths, two destinations. When Oasis sang, I'm going to live forever, Noel Gallagher was right because everybody's going to live forever. The question is, where are we going to live forever? <clears throat> so our final question of the series as we bring this into land today is, who do we tell? Right before Jesus went back to be with his followers, he gave his final instruction. It's known as the Great Commission, but it wasn't just to his disciples, it was to those who follow Christ today. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is our assignment on earth for everybody who calls himself a follower of Christ. Jesus' final instruction to humanity was one word, go. The Greek word is pigiano, which means to keep going. It's actually present tense. The command here is not just to go, but to keep going, 
to keep telling. We are here to help people find the narrow gate that leads to a wide life. Two weeks ago, we talked about those two gates. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate. And narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Chantal and the kids and I, were, we were in America in the summer on holiday, and every morning we hired bicycles, and we did a five-kilometer bike ride, and it was quite interesting doing that with the kids. And on day four of our family bike ride, this crazy eccentric American lady, okay, she started sh shouting out of the window as we're riding our bikes. You're missing the best bits. You're missing the best bits. I'm thinking, love, you're losing your bits. <laughs> and she's going wild. I said, Chantel, do you know? She said, I've never met this lady. And then she just get, anyway, she, she, she drove off. And then about half a kilometer later, she was waiting for us in her car. We said, is everything okay? She says, I've been watching you cycling every morning. She says, you're missing the best bits. You're missing the best bits. I said, well, you need to show us the best bits. So she takes us off the path through this narrow little gate onto this narrow little rocky path. And we arrived 10 minutes later in this beautiful secluded space, this broad secluded place, Plants, fishing, there was a pier, there was just beautiful nature, there was animals. And as she said that, and as we entered this beautiful broad place, I thought this. I thought of Jesus' words. I've never seen it like this, but if we can just put Matthew 7.13 back on the screen. It says right at the end, it says, and only a few find it. Now, I'd always thought, oh, we're kind of the special lot who found it. I don't think Jesus was saying that. I think he was using that as a motivation and as a catalyst. I wonder if only a few find it because only a few know about it. I wonder if we were lucky enough on holiday to discover the large lake and the pier and nature because someone, some crazy lady, had the courage to tell us that we're missing the best bits. Now, I think there's some people in your world and in my world who are missing the best bits. I wonder if Jesus said in this final part of this verse, the way he did was to urge those to share their faith to recognize that there is another gate, there is another path which leads to a different life. Who would agree that every person in your world who doesn't know Jesus would live a vastly better life if they did? Four of us. Okay, who would agree? The person at work who's struggling in their marriage, the person in your world who's addicted to that substance, who would agree? Every person you know who doesn't live Jesus, they would live a vastly better life if they knew him. Does anyone regret coming to Jesus? No. Does anyone regret going through the small gate that lead to a wide life? No. Bill Hybel said this, he said, pointing people to Christ is the best use of a human life. I think we owe it to people to at least give them the option that there's a different path. And this series has all been building towards this final session. Because the majority of us in this room, we kind of know where we're going. We, we, our faith is settled. We, we kind of know where we're, where, where we're heading. But our friends, our family, our university colleagues, our lecturers, many of those people that we go about doing life with, they do not know what's happening. In fact, they're actually scared. My friend Johnny, he was telling me a story this week. He brought an unchurched friend who'd never been to church before to week one of this series. Oh, that made me smile. <laughs> I said, how did he find it? He said, well, interesting enough, he says he went as white as a sheet. His words, not mine. He said, Johnny said, I've never heard anything like it. But at least he knows. At least he can now make a decision how he lives his life and which path he can choose. At least he knows that there is another way. Our role isn't to tell people what to do. It's just to point people in the right direction. 
I think the single greatest gift that we can give someone this Christmas, as much as I know you're generous and you're going to give your spouse a generous gift and you're going to buy your kids things and your neighbors and your community and we're going to do some lovely things, but the greatest single act and greatest gift we can give someone this Christmas is an introduction to Jesus. An introduction to Jesus. Why? Because it will last eternity. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said to them, so wherever, this is our key verse for today, and Jesus said to them, so whenever, wherever you go in the world, tell everyone the good news. I'm going to unpack three more questions today off the back of this one question. Number one is, why don't we tell people? Number two, who do we tell? And number three is, how do we tell people? Why don't we tell people about the good news? I'm going to be totally honest and vulnerable today because I've probably let this slip in my own life over the last 18 months. And like so many of us, I've struggled to share my faith and I'm quite a natural, outgoing person. But there are barriers. There are barriers which stop us sharing our faith. And there was a survey in the UK done recently where they interviewed 1,600 Christians and they were asked about the barriers that stop them sharing their faith. And the top eight barriers were this. The first one was trepidation, fear. 22% of people said, I would share my faith. I'm just, I'm just worried. I'm just fearful. I'm fearful about how people will respond. Am I going to be the weirdo at work? How, what, 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 what's going to happen if I share my faith at school, in, at university? I, I'm, so I'm just fearful. So because of fear, I don't do it. The second barrier was distraction. This is a big one for me. 17% of people said, I'm just so busy. Business, school, uni, exams. We saw, we saw the, the gentleman on the chips and dips stand. I, I imagine that was Norwich Market. And he was asked, would you come to church if you were invited? Never been to church? His answer was yes. I'm sure there's been probably hundreds, if not thousands of Christians that have queued up for chips and dips over the past few years, and maybe I've even been one of them. Yet we've been so busy to get from chips and dips to the school run, to, 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 the, to the event at university, we've missed an opportunity with the chips and dips man. And so we get distracted. The third one, and this is a big one, is rejection. 8% of people said, I would share my faith, but I'm scared of being rejected. I remember we used to have services on a Saturday night <clears throat> In Norwich Market, they were called open air services. So instead of having church service in the building, we would take it out onto outside Top Man. And I was 14 years old. Does anybody remember those services? Diane, Sharon, my mum, there's a few people. 14 years old, and my dad said, You need to get up, son, and you need to share your faith. I'm like 14 years old, nine o'clock on a Saturday night, sharing my faith with, I don't know what it was, Halfords, the sign. And the old person would walk back and forth and I remember just even in, as a young man, just there's no one listening. No one listening to me. And you, so you feel this sense of rejection. And 8% of people struggle with the fact of rejection. The fifth one was preparation. 10% of people said, I would share my faith, but I don't feel equipped. I, I don't feel, in fact, I don't even know what I would say. If someone said to me, tell me about Jesus, I would just get muddled. I would tell you to Google it or call Steve Morstan. Okay, so I, I, it's not that I don't want to share my faith. I just don't know how to share my faith. I don't know enough about it. This is a big one, cancellation. One of the biggest fears is we'll get cancelled. They're going to think I'm so crazy. The mob will come after us and cancel us. You know, even with this series and some of the things that we've said over the past few months, there's definitely a sense of, what happens if the mob start coming after Soul Church? What happens if they start blogging about us and saying things? And, and that, that fear can stop you saying the things which you know are true. And then a big one here, and 20% of people said confrontation. <clears throat> we just don't want to get into confrontation. So many issues around the Bible that we just, it's best just to steer clear of it. So I don't like confrontation. So the best thing I can do is just keep my, keep my quiet little faith to myself. And I think some of those responses are really honest and I think we can all relate to, who can relate to at least one of those, two of those, of reasons why we, we, sometimes we don't share our faith. 
There was a survey done a while back, and I'm going to put a graph on the screen, and it talks about the years of walking with Christ. And in the first year of, first year of finding Christ, the average Christian will share their faith with 20 people. 20 people. They're just so full. I spoke to a gentleman as I shared this in the first service. He said, when I first came to Jesus, he said, I told everyone what Jesus had done in my life. He said, I couldn't help it because I was lost and now I was found. I was in darkness, now I'm in light. But the tragedy is by year eight, it's next to no one. We get so comfortable just coming to church, showing up, reading our Bibles and all the things we're meant to do, we actually forget the last command, which is our first command, where Jesus said, go. Go. Who is glad that someone pushed past one of those eight barriers to reach you with Jesus? All right, keep your hand up if you know the name of the person that led you to Christ, the individual. Mrs. Jones, your Sunday school teacher. It's incredible. Ben, who led you to the Lord? Dick Angia, who is sitting right there. Right there. And we honor you, Dick. Who led you? Antoinette and Russell led you to Christ. Beautiful. Rosemary. Gerald Tufts. Teresa. Cannon Webdale. Who else? Who have we got around here? This lady at the front. My parents. Your parents. What are their names? Liz and Jim. Liz and Jim. Amazing. My son. My grandma. Your grandma. Yeah. What about this side? Who led? Come on, let's. Sir. Phoebe. Phoebe. Amazing. Reverend James. Reverend James. Smiler. Aiden from Radical Church. Amazing. Right at the back, Steve. Matt, sorry. Sister Alice. Sister Alice. Yeah. Wow. Who's grateful for their someone? Yeah. You know, if we really want to leave a legacy and an eternal impact on earth, our goal is to bring someone into God's family. Approximately 65 years ago on Southwold Beach, a mission group led by a few crazy passionate hippies led my dad to the Lord. Just 14, 15 years old. I don't know their names. I'll probably never get to meet them. They've probably all passed away by now. But the legacy of their lives live on. A handful of times a year, I'm standing at the door, I'm walking through Norwich and someone will come up to me and they say, your dad led me to Jesus. Your dad led me to Jesus. Your dad led me to Jesus. Happened just a few weeks ago. Your dad led me to Jesus. Wow. We have to push past the barriers. We have to. We owe it to people. Is anyone grateful that somebody pushed past trepidation, rejection, cancellation to get to you if it wasn't for those hippies on Southwold Beach, I wouldn't be standing here today, and nor would Chantel. And possibly we wouldn't be sitting in this room because someone had the courage and the passion to share their faith when it didn't make sense. This is true legacy. Yeah, I think we need to thank everyone for having the courage to share their faith. You know, this key scripture in Mark 16, 15, it says, Jesus said to them, Jesus said to them, this isn't anyone, this is Jesus' instruction. We actually don't have a choice in this. Jesus didn't say to the disciples, well, if you feel like it, or if you can push, he says, he said to them, yes, there's barriers, but we have to have the courage to move past them. Paul put it like this in Romans, he said, how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard of. How can we expect people to know what's happening in our world, to recognize the times, to talk about eternal destiny if we do not have the courage to at least inform them? 
If you and I never hear, I'm talking to the majority of people in this room are probably Christ followers, but if we never heard another sermon, listened to another podcast, sang another worship song, it would actually be okay because our eternity is secure in Christ. But that is not the case for the majority of people that we come into contact with. And we can go around and we can just live safe, comfortable little lives, get in our takeaways on Uber Eats, watch Netflix and settle down and park our lives at the rapture bus stop. Or we can make a decision. We can make a decision that we don't, <laughs> excuse me, we do not live our lives just for ourselves, but for a greater cause. Why don't we tell? We've got to push past the barriers. The second question we need to ask ourselves is this. Who do we tell? Jesus put it like this. He said, so wherever you go in the world, tell everyone. Two words here. Everywhere, everyone. Everywhere. God is not asking you to make a special trip to Sainsbury's to tell someone about Jesus. You need your carrots. But as you're getting your carrots at the checkout, you have an opportunity to share the love of Jesus. You have an opportunity to be generous with your words. You have an opportunity to be salt and light. Salt and light. You know the thing about salt and light, as Jesus describes us, is they both don't make any noise. But they both make a lot of difference. If I go to McDonald's and my fries do not have enough salt, I am going back. Because I'm not wasting 560 calories on fries with no salt. Because little things make a big difference. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I'm going to stop the car, go back and put salt on them. Because fries without soul are tasteless. Christians without soul are tasteless. We have to be the God colors, the God flavors in this world. Everywhere and everyone. That was Jesus' instruction. The average person in the UK has 200 people in their circle. 200 people. For university, college, school, hairdressers, person you see at the kiosk, the person in the petrol station, we have around 200 people that we would regularly touch base with, touch points. They're the people that Jesus is talking about. George Whitfield, the founder of the Methodist, he said this, he said, God forbid that I should travel with anybody a quarter of an hour without speaking of Christ to them. That's a challenging thought. Sometimes we can go 12 months without speaking of Christ. Jesus spent his time with 12 rogues. They were rough, they were raw. They were tough guys, they were fishermen. If you've been around fishermen, you know they're interesting characters. Their language is colorful, they they smell interesting. (laughs) And trust me, they weren't just drinking apple ties with their fish and chips. These guys were raw. But Jesus sowed his life into them. And I don't think in this, in this scripture Jesus is asking us to win the world. I think he's asking us to win someone in our world. To start with one. To start with one. First person that I can recollect leading to Christ was a, a young man by the name of John in DY in Sydney. And we'd been asked to plant a church in Bible school, a church plant in the little town of D.Y. on the coast there, and I was asked with Chantel to be the youth pastors. And so we, we thought the best thing was hire a, hire a school hall, put some pizzas on, some food and some games, and put flyers through the local school and the neighborhoods. So we did all that. And uh, Friday night came, 7 o'clock. Guess how many people showed up? Not one. I felt so despondent and so discouraged the first time I was ever given opportunity, and we both felt like pretty much failures, and we are on the way back to our halls of residence, and I said to, so said to Chantel, maybe it's just not for us. Maybe, maybe we're just not called to this. Maybe ministry is not our thing. And she's like, maybe we should just give it one more week. One more week. So we kind of changed tack a little bit. We decided to have a volleyball competition on the beach. So we put some flyers again around, put volleyball competition, come out to DY, Friday o'clock, Friday 7 o'clock, and uh, some hot dogs. Four kids showed up. One of the kids was a guy called John. Little did I know that he was just 15, 16 at the time, and he would, he would go on to become a youth pastor and a pastor. He would go on to make a huge difference 
in the world. I'm not saying that because of me, I'm saying that is this, is that all of us can reach someone and none of us know the impact that that someone may reach for Christ in their sphere of influence. I pray that this message is making every person in this room a little uncomfortable today because that's what it was designed to do. We cannot keep Jesus to ourselves. We have to let him outside of the box. We all have an opportunity this Christmas season to share the love of Jesus, whether it's in Tesco's, at the butchers, with a family member, wherever it is, but we have a responsibility and an opportunity to share the love of Christ. So the question is this, who is your one? Who is your one? Who is the one person that needs Jesus most in your world right now? I don't think Jesus is asking, Jesus only handled 12. I don't think he's asking us to handle the world. I think he's asking us to go after the one, to go after one person. Why don't we tell? Who do we tell? And finally, is how do we tell? How do we do it? Well, Jesus said he made it easier for us because he said, tell everyone that good news. This is, this is probably the hardest part. How do we tell? But it's also the most rewarding because the answer is in the text. Jesus makes it easier by explaining, we're not just sharing any news. We're sharing good news. Who loves good news? I love sharing good news. Good news. I love broadcasting good news from this stage. The gospel is good news. The news that we're sharing to our friends, this isn't bad news. This isn't something that's going to inhibit their lives. This is something that's going to actually take their lives forward. I love sharing the glorious good news, the gospel with people. If, if the next generation, if our youth stop spreading the good news, Christianity will be extinct in 100 years. If we stop sharing the good news, it will be extinct. Because that's what happens. And I can guarantee the people in your world and my world, they are being bombarded with bad news. There is so much bad news. We have an opportunity daily to bring good news. Jesus is the hope of the world. We're starting a new series next week called The Spirit of Christmas. And we're going to bring the hope and the love and the joy of peace to our community and our world this Christmas. Because it's good news. We get to bring the good news. I want you to share, just really quickly, six or seven really helpful steps in sharing the good news, and we're going to pray. The first is this. We've actually been anointed to bring good news. Luke 14 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and he has anointed me to bring good news. Good news. Good news. Some people have got really professional at bringing bad news. You know when you see bad news people walking towards you? Have you heard? Did you see? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to bring good news. When you get to Asda tomorrow for your shop, you have been anointed to find someone to bring the good news. That could be a hug, that could be a prayer, that could be a blessing. When was the last time we blessed someone with some groceries? I'll get yours. the good news. Why did you do that? Because I'm a Christ follower. And the love of Christ compels me to be a blessing to people. We've actually been anointed. You have been commissioned. Tonight, we're praying for people to be filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because when the Spirit of the Lord God comes upon you, He gives you the strength to bring the good news. It is not in your strength, but in His strength. Which brings me on to my next point. We don't have to rely on our own strength. Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. We don't have to rely on our strength, but his strength. Third thing when it comes to sharing steps to leading someone to Christ is we've got to focus on God's love towards them. You know, people want to focus on their mistakes. People want to focus on their shame and their guilt, but actually focus on what Christ has done for them. Often people, they, 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 only, they, they think of God as this big, mad, bad God in the air who's ready to beat them up for every mistake that they've ever made. But we need, we need to dispel that myth. For God so loved the world. 
God is a God of love and patience and kindness. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Fourthly, help them understand that sin separates us from God. Sin is simply, the Bible calls it, missing the mark. We miss the mark. The reality is, the Bible says in Romans, it says, for all have sinned, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. None of us were good enough. We've all made mistakes. We've all done things, said things, seen things that we shouldn't have done. But our sin, it needed to be paid for. That's why God sent Jesus and he paid the bill for our sin. Explain to them simply that their sins can be forgiven. And then fifthly, explain that God wants a relationship with them. The two greatest human desires are to be loved and to love. They're the greatest human desires. And most people are searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. Because we all want to be loved. We want to feel needed. So it's not actually the desires that are wrong. It's where we look for them that's wrong. But that's what a relationship with Jesus does. It says, hey, you desire to be loved. I want to pour my love on you. You don't have to look for love in a relationship that's going to let you down. or in, in, Whatever it is, you can find love and true satisfaction in the Father. James 4.8 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. And then this is the fun bit. Invite them to rewrite their story. Who's glad that someone invited you to rewrite your story? A story that maybe had some really bad moments, a story that had some dark pages, a story that was really heading in the wrong direction, then Jesus came in. But somebody invited you to rewrite your story. And oftentimes, we can get nervous at this point, but we have to ask people this important question. I ask this question at the end of every single service. Our kids team do, our youth team do, our young adults team. We ask this question every single service. And it's the most important question that any of us can ever be asked. And it's this, would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? And give people the choice. You know, I, I don't think leading someone to Christ is, is a robotic thing. It doesn't have to be a system. It doesn't have to be a process or points. It simply comes out of relationship. That's why the person in Tesco's is so important to build relationship. It's taken, Billy Graham talks about the 10 steps to finding Christ. And maybe God has brought you on the path of someone's relationship to Christ just to move them from a five to a six. Maybe you're going to be the hug that they need to help them know that someone saw them, someone cares for them. Maybe you're going to be the listening ear this week at work. Maybe the, you know, I, I was speaking to someone at chaplaincy yesterday and they were in a desperate state and I was able just to listen. I didn't say anything, I just listened. Sometimes the best use of our time is to say nothing. There's nothing you can say when someone loses a loved one like the Fields and the Hollingers. There's nothing you can say apart from just to listen and say, I'm here for you. But that moment can help people on their journey to faith. This week, we're all helping people towards that moment. You know what happens when we share our faith? Billy Graham put it like this. He said, our faith becomes stronger when we share it. Do you know how bold I feel after I've shared my faith? Maybe our faith is weak because we've stopped sharing it. If you stop working out your muscles in the gym, do you know what happens? They become weak. But when you begin to push those barbells again, when you begin to lift those weights, you know what happens? Your muscles begin to strengthen. And faith is like a muscle. It needs to be used. And when you share your faith, you strengthen your faith. And so leading someone to Jesus, whether it's just a step, whether it's saying that prayer, it actually strengthens you. So it's not like you miss out or you lose out because your faith is strengthened. In the first service, Pete Reeve was in church and I had the privilege of meeting Pete in, into sports just by a complete accident. We just bumped into each other at a sporting event. We got talking. Before I know it, he opened up his story to me and we began to talk, share his faith. I began to share my faith and a few weeks later he came to church. I was able to lead him to Jesus. And now he has led countless people to Christ. Just bumped into him. It wasn't 
I didn't go to into I am going to find someone who doesn't know Jesus and I am going to no no it wasn't any of that it was just simply just bump into people along life's journey someone broke down on the side of the road maybe that's the person maybe that's the person maybe that's the best best breakdown they'll ever have in their car because you've seen them and you get an opportunity to share the love of Jesus through giving them a jump start not just in their car but in their life because that's what Jesus will do we give our lives so others can find theirs. Why? Because Jesus gave his life so I could find mine. Why don't we tell? We've got to push past the barriers. Who do we tell? Everyone and everywhere. And how do we tell? We just share the good news. This is good news. It's the power of God unto salvation. So how do we, how do we conclude a message like this? Well, Paul, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, chapter 1, verse 18, he says, Open the eyes of my understanding. Open the eyes of my heart. And I pray that this is our prayer today, this week, that simply God would open our eyes, push past our barriers, our prejudices, push past opinion, even tradition. Maybe it even means disrupting some of our traditions this Christmas. Dad and mum, most Christmases would have a stranger in our home at Christmas. Because that's what Jesus said. He said, invite those who don't have family to your table. I wonder who will be sitting around your Christmas table. And that's not to judges, that's to challenges. To saying that there is a world out there of lonely people. And Christmas can be such a lonely time. But it doesn't need to be such a lonely time. It can be an opportunity to love people. We're all here today because somebody pushed past their traditions. Somebody pushed past their barriers. Somebody paid the price. So I want to throw out a challenge to the church. This is, this is the challenge. Between now and Christmas 2024, 12 and a bit months, I want to pray that we all have an opportunity to personally lead someone to Jesus. Statistics say that 95% of Christians have never led anyone to Christ. Wow. What if someone asked you, wonder whether today might be the catalyst to give you the courage to push past some of those barriers to help someone say yes. Soul Church, go and make disciples. I wonder if Jesus was here today. Maybe he'd make it personal. He would say, Soul Church. Go and make disciples. Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was his last command on earth. The famous quote says his last command needs to be our first priority. Two thirds of God's name is go. We've got to go. Go tell the good news. Let's read our verse one more time. And then he told them, Jesus, go into all the world, everywhere and everyone, and preach the good news. Wow. Do you know what? To be honest, why, why do we need more people? Why do we need more people in this church? It's, it's already busy, and I'll tell you what, that car park's driving me crazy. There was a lorry there today, and I couldn't get past, and my coffee's been cold, two weeks running, and it's just too many people. What if we said that in 2015 when there was 300 people in this church? If we said enough was enough? You wouldn't be sitting here. We have to compel them to come. As long as there is one person left in Norfolk who does not know Jesus Christ, we have got to keep sharing the glorious good news. Imagine if every person took on, took on, that mandate over the next 12 months to lead someone to Christ, 100% growth. I'm not talking about 100% growth in Soul Church, I'm talking about in the kingdom. The kingdom of God would advance in our city and beyond. It's not about a brand, it's not about a church, it's about seeing the kingdom of God move forward. 
Imagine if we have to start the new building with an extra service. We're starting with two, but imagine if three and then four. And you know, that building has been designed so we can actually knock the back wall down and push out so it can be bigger. That's how it was designed. He's saying, you're crazy. We haven't even paid for this one. God will work it out. We're not going to settle. We're not going to pull back. We're not going to get comfy. As long as Chantal and I are leading this church, we are going to continue to advance, love people, help people, reach people, treasure people, find people, care for people. We've got to keep moving forward. This is true legacy. This is true human legacy. Everybody desires to leave a legacy. You know what? We do that through life's accomplishments. We do that through achievements. We do that through a name on the wall somewhere or a bench in a park, writing a book or an inheritance. And all those things are good, but all those things are temporary. They eventually fade away. But salvation is the only legacy that lasts forever. There is no greater legacy than bringing someone into the family of God. You know what God's will is? That none should perish, but all should have everlasting life. So what's our goal? None. Our goal is none. The goal is that none would perish on our watch in Norwich, in Norfolk. It's the great commission. It's not the great suggestion. Now, if you say today, John, I'm in. Don't clap me, but if you're saying today, I'm taking this message seriously. And I'm going to be vulnerable here. I've taken my foot off the gas over the last 18 months because I'm a natural evangelist. I find it quite easy to share my faith. But because of everything that's been happening around me, it's been easier to duck and dive. But I said to God on Friday as I was putting this together, God, I need to get my mojo back when it comes to evangelism. I've got to get it back. Because I don't want a building and to be known, John, who built the Soul Church building. That is not legacy. That is not legacy. I want people to find Christ because of the life I lived. That's true legacy. And if you're saying to hey John, I'm with you. I'm taking this, I've got comfortable. But today I wanna shine the light of Jesus. I wanna spread the love of Jesus. I wanna lead someone to Christ in this next 12 months. And you know who I'm talking about because that name, as soon as I say it, flashed through your mind. It could be a son. It could be a friend, a community member. It could be a, an individual, a student at school, at university. But you know there's someone in your world that needs Christ. And you're part of that process of them finding him. I want you to stand right now. I want you to stand. You're not standing for me. You're standing for, you're standing for faith. You're standing for Christ. You're saying, God, use me. Use me. Use me. So lift our hands right now. I want you to begin to pray. Pray for God opportunities. Pray that God would give you faith. Pray that God would give you the courage to push past some of those barriers. Rejection, intimidation, trepidation, cancellation, all those things that stop us from sharing our faith. Information, maybe it's a lack of knowledge, saying, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna just, I'm gonna explore the Christian faith further. I wanna get grounded in my faith. So Father God, you've called us to leave true legacy on this earth. So we ask us that you would give us a Holy Spirit boldness as we leave this place, Father. I pray that this message today will motivate us all to get serious about recognizing the times and sharing the gospel. We ask for divine opportunities to listen, to share, to pray, to give this Christmas. We pray for those sons and daughters mums and dads, grandparents, those down our street, that you would give us the courage to share Jesus. If that just means being salt and light at the start, Father, that's what we will do. Father God, use me. Use me. I want you to say that out loud. Father God, use me. I am the answer to someone else's prayer. Use me to lead someone to Jesus this Christmas. Father God, help me. Give me boldness. Give me courage. In Jesus' name. 
Thank you for watching Soul Church Online. If the service blessed you today, why don't you share and subscribe to this channel so you don't miss the things that are coming up in the life of our church. We also want to give you an opportunity to give and support the work here at Soul Church by heading to the website soulchurch.com and we want to continue to support, love, help and share the gospel of good news of Jesus in our city and beyond. So thank you for your contribution. Take care and remember, God is for you.